My name is Alex Burns and I'm a member of the uh, P3 development team here and work on creating um, all of what we're going to look at today. I'm also going to be joined by Brent Kamet, who's a senior member of our safety and training team. So between the two of us, we'll kind of talk through some of the finer points of the cathodic protection tracking and, and how we handle that through our P3 mobile application as, as far as completing the actual inspection. And then we're gonna jump over and take a look at what that functionality looks like in our P3 desktop application and what we kind of do to help you track all this data and, and all of that. So with that said, I think we'll just jump right in. Um, this is what we're looking at here is just if I were logged in as, as a technician, uh, this would be the first thing that I would see when I log into the mobile application. So from here, I'm just going to get started on the inspection itself. So once we've entered an account number, client, and then actual address, that'll bring us right into the beginning of the inspection. So from here, since we're dealing with an underground container, I'm just going to enter the container serial number. And this is a, one of the components of P3 is if that container exists in our system and as soon as the serial number is entered, any data that's related to the container itself is going to come directly through and doesn't need to be re-entered. So all the basic data, it's always going to stay the same with that container no matter what, those data points are going to come through. So we can see all of that all filled out. And once that's been completed, and also if you don't have that information entered, the technician can certainly key that information as they're going through the inspection. But um, this is nice and efficiency gain here. On the right-hand side of the screen is really going to be everything related to the actual inspection. This is that snapshot moment in time, the fact that you're capturing this inspection today at this time. So I think with that, maybe I'll have Brent kind of jump in and, and talk through some of the detail here. Sure, thank you, Alex. So yes, obviously uh, some things will be uh, apparent when we're making this inspection and some things will not. For example, the foundation of the container and underground containers, some local municipalities require it to be anchored to a, a concrete container or non-combustible uh, foundation in some way, shape or form. So you would document what that condition was. If it's code compliant, it is okay. Um, if it's a takeover, then obviously it would be not visible. You would not know what's going on underneath that underground container. Um, if there was something that needed to be addressed, the other example we've given you is corrective action. So for example, if uh, the container was uh, you know, exposed to the elements and not completely buried, well then we could you know, note that. And then the, <clears throat> excuse me, location. Uh, obviously we're looking at this from an NFPA 58 code compliance standpoint. And if it has all the setbacks from sources of ignition, opening to buildings, uh, respective to property lines, then you would select okay, it is code compliant. And if not, you would select corrective action required. And in the comments section, you could give us a brief description of what the issue is and how it needs to be addressed. The condition of the container, uh, once again, code compliant, it's okay. If it's a takeover, it's not visible. And what we mean by that is you may be able to see a portion of that underground container, meaning the dome or what's exposed. But in some cases, they can be filled with sand, debris, chipmunk residue, et cetera. So please make sure you're doing a good visual inspection on the portion you can see. And if it is, then you would select okay. If it's not visible, you'd select that. If there was corrective action that needed to be done, you would address that. And then the relief valve, uh, the, uh, the condition of it, again, code compliant, okay. Uh, corrective action needed. Maybe the uh, one of the tines that holds back the spring pressure is broken. So you would want to address that and do a proper inspection and never, of course, put your face over the relief valve. Um, and then on the relief valve date, sometimes these can be difficult to see. We respect and appreciate that. So you would put that information in if you can find it. We've also given you the box that you can check if it is not visible. I would caution all technicians, do not use that not visible as the easy button, because in case of an emergency, if something bad were to happen in a court of law, if they could find that date and you selected not visible, you can see the liability that could come from that. So we've given you that option, but by all means, do not use it as the easy button. And then we recommend that all technicians and all delivery drivers uh, have extra relief valve caps, depending on the type of relief valve. 
the relief valve is super important. Every container has to have one. And when you need a relief valve to work, you would really like that to work properly. So make sure you're protecting them by putting a cap uh, over whatever type of relief valve is on that container. If it's all good, select OK. And then, of course, the fittings leak test. We should be soaping up everything on that container, the gauge, the fittings, uh, the, the cluster, the neck of the container, etc., cetera, the uh, evacuation valve, and making certain everything is leak free. Uh, the other thing that I always like to recommend here is uh, please stress to your folks that they should be doing this before the container even leaves the yard. And then once again, when you're at the customer's location and installing the container, that way there it saves time and headache. And then of course, we're gonna obtain the other information that is super important. Um, anything off of that data plate from the underground container, the year manufactured, et cetera. And then here, of course, we have the cathodic protection installation date. Uh, you may or may not know that. Uh, is the tank isolated? And if you're not familiar, that would be some type of dielectric protection for an underground metallic uh, line that feeds the building. Uh, here, in a nutshell, we do not want the anode bags overtasked. We want them to only uh, deal or protect what's metallic in the ground and not the 60 feet of black iron pipe that's in the customer's basement. So please indicate whether it's isolated or not. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, we can certainly help you with that here at P3 for more information or training around that. The number of anodes, if you're installing the container, obviously you would know the answer to that. If it is a takeover, you may not, so you may want some literature from the customer. Um, and then most importantly is what type of inspection are we doing here? Is it the initial inspection? Meaning NFPA has given us set parameters on timeframes when we can and have to perform these cathodic reads. So the initial would be from zero to six months of either installing or taking over the container. Obviously, if you're installing it, you can get that first cathodic read. Uh, the second, uh, if it's a takeover, well, then obviously it's in the ground. If it was December or January here in New England anyway, well, you would have that window of zero to six months to get your first read. And then you can get your secondary or confirmation read, which has to be done between 12 and 18 months, again, per NFPA. And of course, if it passes that secondary or confirmation, you can then pace, place it on a 36 month rotation. Uh, if any of these inspections fails, the time clock does start all over again. So please keep that in mind and, and instruct your employees to such. And then the anode type, I'm sorry, anode size, um, depending on what size you like to use within your organization. Uh, here in New England, probably the most common is a 17 pound. Uh, but there are others based on application, et cetera. And then, of course, the anode type. Is it the uh, magnesium alloy? Is it the high potential? Is it zinc? If you don't know, obviously, we've given you a section here that you can select. It's unknown. For example, if it was a takeover, you may not know what type of anode bag was used by the installer. So we've given you that option to select that. Now we get down to our diagram here where we have the uh, the readings for the cathodic. Uh, we like to get five readings here at P3. Uh, so we're going to get one at the uh, one o'clock, I'm sorry, the noon, the three o'clock, the six o'clock, and the nine o'clock position. And then we also like to get a fifth reading right on top of the container. So you get that read uh, between the soil and the container or the bare steel. And the readings are something that's very important. So the little question mark that you see here next to that, every, every aspect of uh, P3, we call this our mobile professor. If the technician's unsure of how to get the reads or what the reads need to be, well, you can see here we've given them all kinds of information. The tank diagram, uh, the tank to soil reading, GPS coordinates, which are super helpful for delivery purposes and service technician uh, responding to a, a, a call at that customer's location. And now let's go ahead and get some reads. So we'll put in a negative 0.75 and Alex can run through those particular reads. And we do have some error recognition built into P3. So therefore, if the read is not acceptable, we're gonna let you know that. And for those of you that are not sure, a proper cathetic, cathodic reading is a negative 0.85 or greater negative, meaning uh, negative 0.86, negative 0.90, negative 1.22, 0.35 would all be acceptable reads. And you can see, that negative 0.75 we put in is not acceptable. So we're putting a comment in the comment section, possible anode retrofit needed, maybe a tank swap out. 
And when we try to save it, we can see that P3 has documented that that is a non-compliant test reading, and it's telling us why it's non-compliant per NFPA. Would we like to continue? Well, at that time, we would either choose to retrofit or have to do some corrective action and return at a later date to make it acceptable. So now that we've completed the inspection, now we'll follow it back over to uh, 2P3. So it brings us right in here. This is now, we're in the, uh, the desktop application. So what you see here first is our dashboard, and then we'll head up to the reporting section, and then we'll go directly to the cathodic protection inspection tracking here. And once we get onto this screen, what we'll be able to see here is just kind of a general overview of, of all things sort of cathodic protection related. Um, over here on the left, you're gonna see an overview of all the inspections that still need to take place. On the left-hand side of the screen, you're gonna see any that are not current. This is gonna be any test that has taken place in the past, but is now overdue. It's time to get out there and retest that container. And then over on the right side of the screen, this is gonna be any of your underground containers that have never had a cathodic inspection that have gone uh, into P3. And then to kind of round out all of your, kind of the, the total of all your underground tanks, we're gonna, you'll see over here, any that are current. So based on that, just to give you an idea of what the actual document looks like, we'll, we'll pull that up and, and take a look just so you can get a sense of what we just created here. So this is just a you know general overview of everything that we just completed, and this is what you'll now uh, have on file for for that account for that container. One thing that's super important there is you can see we have the customer owned uh, or company owned section. Uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of propane companies out there that have spent tens of thousands of dollars in regards to excavation, uh, because when a customer wants a good price per gallon, they own the container, and they're more than happy to say that. Uh, whether they have documentation or not is another story but of course when that emergency situation takes place and you get a call that the container is leaking well then you know somebody has to address that immediately and oftentimes it's the uh, propane marketer that ends up footing the bill for excavation to remove that leaking container right away so that's a super important uh, portion of this form make sure you get that with proper documentation on day one back to the cathodic dashboard here Okay, and then I don't know, Brent, did you want to speak to this, the last couple things here, this section? Absolutely. So you can see in the very bottom there, we have the number five, which is AGUG, which is not specified. What that stands for is either above ground or underground. So in other words, in your database, you do not know whether it's an above ground or underground container. Obviously, that's kind of important. So I would that would be a red flag to me as a, a propane marketer. I would want to get somebody out to that customer address immediately and obtain that information. Uh, and container information so we knew what was going on in the future. Of course, if we don't know if it's underground, we don't know if our cathodic reads are in compliance or if they need to be done. So uh, make sure you have good data and good information on that. And uh, you can see on the, uh, as Alex mentioned, we have 30 that are not current, meaning we do not have proper cathodic reads in the time interval. And then we have 36 that do not have inspections at all. So some valuable information there so you can schedule your service department. Finally, up here in the corner and the bright orange is really our action required section. So this, these are, these are going to be important ones to be taken a look at. So I'll let Brent speak to that as well. So yeah, if there's service required, well, it could be things. It could be that we need to have a dielectric union uh, installed so we get that isolation. It could be that we need tank replacement. It could be that the reading is out of range and we need to do something to figure that out. Um, so, of course, you need somebody to respond to that customer's address and, of course, address this information. But the beautiful thing about P3 is it's going to tell you what the issue was, so that way that you can schedule that uh, from a service manager standpoint. All right, wonderful. Well, I think that that basically concludes just, again, wanted to kind of give you a a, a general overview of, of what the cathodic capabilities are in P3.